Floating around the interweb and other places is an uh, easy identification of conservatism with free market policies. An economic liberalizing policy is proposed, read it somewhere, and journalists will label it as a conservative policy. Uh, com commentators, depending on where they're coming from, will bemoan or celebrate the advance of conservatism. Of course, we know political labelings often sloppy, political movements are often big tent, but it is important to keep up the effort to be precise so we know what each other is talking about. Precision, also important because sometimes those who accept some free market policies, they're just doing so for political expediency reasons, and their superficial acceptance of a free market policy can mask a more fundamental suspicion or rejection of free markets that matters in the medium to long term. Now, it's also important because for those of us who are free market capitalists, as I am, when we push on conservative positions, we regularly realize that our opponents come not only from the political left, they also come from the political right. Conservatives, leftists, they disagree with each other, but they both disagree with liberal capitalists. The general point here is going to be that political debates are rarely two-way, almost always liberal capitalists face opposition from at least two directions. Now, take one recent example. President Donald Trump never identified as a liberal in the press, but he is regularly identified as a conservative. At the same time, clearly he's in favor of a whole battery of government subsidies, trade restrictions, higher taxes on imports, using political power to intimidate private businesses, and so on. All of those things are profoundly anti-free market positions. All of them are, at the same time, near to Trump's heart and centerpieces of his policy making. So, it's fine if you want to call him a conservative, and if we read that in the press, but clearly he is a different kind of animal from left socialists and from free market capitalists. Now, the feud between uh, Trump and billionaire Charles Koch, Koch makes this very clear. Koch is, in fact, a principled free market capitalist. He did not support Trump's campaign financially or morally. When Trump came to office, he's been opposing many of Trump's policies, and that makes perfect sense. Now, some uh, conceptualization and terminology issues here. Conservatism. Conservatism is a relative and a variable concept. It means maintaining or conserving the best of the conserv current system. That's to say whatever you take the current system's best to be. But what is the current system? system. Now, conservatives in Russia, conservatives in Nigeria, conservatives in Argentina, and so on, all of them can and will be very different from each other because the systems that they're trying to conserve are very different. The direct contrast to conservative is the concept of revolutionary. A revolutionary rejects the basics of the current system. But a revolutionary in a theocracy is not the same thing as a revolutionary in a communist system. Now, we have to contrast relative political concepts like conservative and revolutionary with concepts that designate timeless principles of content like liberal, monarchist, fascist, and so on. Liberal means committed to making individual freedom politically basic, whatever the current system is. Monarchism always means concentrating power hierarchically with a single person in overall charge. Fascism means an ethnically based collectivism with the government in charge of coordinating all of society's social subunits and so on. Friedrich Nietzsche was famous for his statement that God is dead and his provocative account of master and slave moralities. 
and also for the fact that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis claim that Nietzsche was one of their great inspirations. Were the Nazis right to do so, or did they misappropriate Nietzsche's philosophy? Professor Stephen Hicks's concisely written book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, based on the 2006 documentary, corrects many widespread misconceptions about Nietzsche, giving a fascinating and easy to understand analysis of Nietzsche's work, asking and answering a number of questions, such as what were the key elements of Hitler and the National Socialist political philosophy? How did the Nazis come to power in a nation as educated and civilized as Germany? What was Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy? The philosophy of live dangerously, and that which does not kill us makes us stronger? And to what extent did Nietzsche's philosophy provide a foundation for the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis? Professor Hicks demonstrates his mastery of this subject using quotes and critical analysis that prove his points and show the true linkage between Nietzsche and the Nazis, and how philosophical ideas move the world. Get your copy of Nietzsche and the Nazis by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com today. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast hosted by Hicks himself on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Let's turn, though, to contemporary North America's scene with its tendency to sort people into liberals on the left, conservatives on the right. Now, that we're, those are all big tent labels. We're always arguing about how to place libertarians, progressive socialists, theocrats, and all the others. Now, most of the time in the North American context, it's those on the left who will identify conservatives with free market capitalism, and their thinking is this. You know, we progressives or we socialists, we are hostile to capitalism, and we are on the left. So from our perspective, the capitalists must be on the right with the conservatives because we dislike both of them. Now, their claim does have a grain of journalistic truth. You can find conservatives who advocate some capitalism. You can find capitalists who are conservative on some things. But when we look at what the big-brained theoreticians of conservatism and capitalism say, then the journalistic usage and the journalistic language has a very big problem. And that's because for over a century, all the deep thinkers on the conservative side, almost without exception, have argued that conservatives cannot be capitalists. And the deep thinkers on the free market side have, again, almost without exception, gone out of their way to explain why they're not conservatives. And both sides are correct. That's my judgment. But let's start with some big name conservatives. Now, again, definitionally, we run into issues in the American context. There are lots of subspecies of conservatism. There are religious conservatives, neoconservatives, traditional conservatives, right? paleoconservatives, middle of the road conservatives, and so on. I'm going to sample what some representatives of each of the subspecies have said about free market capitalism. So just to start, let's take Robert Bork, and I'm going to use him as a representative of a kind of religious conservatism. Bork, famous for being the legal scholar whom the U.S. Senate rejected uh, for a seat on the Supreme Court. Ronald Reagan, when he was president, had nominated him, but Bork was shot down for ideological reasons. He was just too conservative. Look at some of Bork's writings. This is a quotation I'm going to read now from his best-selling book, Slouching Towards Gomorrah. Notice the religiously tinged language there in the title, in which Bork makes clear his views on free market capitalism. He is disdainful and outright contemptuous right, of the freedom element within both liberalism and free market capitalism. Quote, because both libertarians and modern liberals are oblivious to social reality, both demand radical personal autonomy in expression, unquote. And here's the money bit, quoting again. That is one reason libertarians are not to be confused, as they often are, with conservatives, unquote. Bork goes on to argue that, quote, Free market economists are particularly vulnerable to the libertarian virus, unquote. Now, notice the virus language. Now, Bork goes on to cite errors about ethics and human nature as the root problem. Too often, the free market economist, in his words, quote, ignores the question of which wants it is moral to satisfy, 
unquote. The free market economist fails to recognize that, again, quote, unconstrained human nature will seek degeneracy often enough to create a disorderly, hedonistic, and dangerous society, unquote. Now, notice the strong language, right, and the philosophical language. The free market unleashes degeneracy. It's like a virus. So as a conservative, right, he's opposed on philosophical grounds, right? Free market capitalists have the wrong view of human nature, the wrong view of the moral order, the wrong view of what virtue is. Next, I want to uh, try Irving Kristol, usually labeled a neoconservative. Sometimes uh, Kristol is referred to as the godfather of neoconservative school of thinking. But a quotation here from uh, uh, his book. Actually, he was a contributor to the book and a co-editor. The book's called Capitalism Today. Quote, the inner spiritual chaos of the times, so powerfully created by the dynamics of capitalism itself, is such as to make nihilism an easy temptation. A free society in Hayek's sense gives birth in massive numbers to free spirits emptied of moral substance. Unquote. Now, Crystal is uh, referring to the free market capitalist economist uh, Friedrich Hayek, who was and is uh, widely admired in free market capitalist circles for good reason. But notice Crystal's strong language again. Right? Free market capitalism leads to chaos, metaphysical problems, nihilism, moral emptiness. And again, we have a philosophical rejection from a conservative perspective of free market capitalism. All right, let's try another kind of conservatism here. I'll have a traditional conservative emphasizing traditionalism. Russell Kirk, famous uh, scholar here as representative. Uh, here's one sympathetic scholar writing for the Conservative Heritage Foundation, putting it this way. Quote, to Russell Kirk, true conservatism Burke's conservatism, parenthetical remark here, as Edmund Burke, 1790s, wrote on the French Revolution influentially. All right, back to the quote. Burke's conservatism was utterly antithetical to unrestrained capitalism and the egoistic ideology of individualism. Now notice the utterly antithetical. Kirk uh, goes on to single out Ayn Rand's free market advocacy for criticism. Kirk writes that, quote, We flawed human creatures are sufficiently selfish already without being exhorted to pursue selfishness on principle, unquote. Under ruthless capitalism, Kirk goes on to argue, a man becomes, quote, a social atom starved for most emotions except envy and ennui, severed from true family life, and reduced to mere household life. His old landmarks buried, his old faiths dissipated, unquote. Beautiful language, but notice that a conservative must be opposed to capitalism's individualism, its atomism, its selfishness. The conservative must accept that human beings are fundamentally flawed creatures. All right, another kind of conservatism. Uh, this one, a public intellectual I've got here, Pat Buchanan, take him to be a representative of paleoconservatism. Paleo from the Greek means old, so an old-style conservative. A couple of articles I'm going to quote from here. In one, uh, uh, Buchanan asks, is capitalism diabolical? Right, right. Now notice, again, the religiously tinged language here. And as a good Catholic, he notes that, quote, the church has a long tradition of criticizing capitalism. Unquote. Now, Buchanan himself uh, finds himself torn between recognizing the benefits that capitalism has brought to America, but at the same time being loyal to the old doctrines of the church. At the same time, in another article, he goes on to oppose the, quote, godless capitalism, unquote, that has brought us the global economy. Global capitalism, he claims, allows soulless corporations to, quote, shift factories and plants out of the high-wage, well-regulated U.S. economy to Mexico, China, and India, 
Then to Bangladesh, Haiti, and Cambodia, produce for pennies, ship their products back to the USA, sell here at the same old price, and pocket the difference, unquote. All right, obviously all of that's bad. And instead of looking after our own workers, as responsibly we should do, we let the capitalists fire them, we let them send their jobs to foreigners, again in the name of profit. Capitalist corporations, including our own, have gotten fat by, quote, gutting our own, unquote. All right, now I'm going to just step outside of the American context for a minute for partly contemporary reasons and mention Alexander Solzhenitsyn here. Uh, Solzhenism is uh, enjoying a resurgence of popularity and his form of conservatism in North America, in part, I think, uh, largely inspired by the rise of Jordan Peterson. Solzhenitsyn uh, rejects socialism, especially the brutal communistic form he experienced directly in the Soviet Union. But Solzhenitsyn, it's also important to remember, also rejects harshly the freedom elements in free market liberalism. This is from an invited speech at Harvard, I think the year is 1987 or so. Quote, destructive and irresponsible freedom has been granted boundless space. Society has turned out to have scarce defense against the abyss of human decadence. For example, against the misuse of liberty for moral violence against young people, such as motion pictures full of pornography, crime, and horror. So, it's not a big step to see that if uh, we're interested in avoiding human decadence, if we're interested in protecting society, if we're going to stop all of the moral violence against young people, it's not going to be a big step that Solzhenitsyn's views are going to require some severe limits on the freedom that leads exactly to those things, to prevent it from generating so much immorality. Join Professor Stephen Hicks on his Adventures in Postmodernism tour next March in Australia, where he'll be giving you his insights and lessons on the subject firsthand. Find out what makes postmodernism attractive. Why is it so dangerous? How has it evolved or mutated over the years? Does postmodernism have strong connections to neo-Marxism? What is the role of it in cultural wars, campus battles over free speech, political correctness, intellectual diversity, identity politics and the rise of Antifa and alternative right? What other political movements are now adopting postmodernism strategies, and how do we resolve these issues of postmodernism? Stephen Hicks will be appearing in four major Australian cities throughout March 2019. He'll be doing an evening talk in Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide and Brisbane starting at 7pm, and will be holding an all-day special event masterclass series starting at 9am on March 10th in Melbourne and March 16th in Sydney where he will delve even deeper into understanding postmodernism, its history, and teach you valuable strategies to actually combat it. For full details and to reserve your tickets today, go to truearrowevents.com. Select the event to which you would like to attend, and if you hurry, you may even be lucky enough to get your tickets at early bird prices at a 50% discount. And while you're online, please leave us a review for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. I think that at the heart of all of these conservatisms, there's a recognition that capitalism threatens traditional morality, traditional understandings of order, and what it means to be a human being. Now, conservative uh, columnist George Will, now conservative uh, columnist, yes, sometimes he has, I think, some free market capitalist instincts, some more libertarian instincts, and uh, Will's views have evolved. But at this time that I'm quoting from, he made a very good argument that we really have to make a hard choice between two alternatives. This speaks to our theme here. Here's the choice. One alternative is cultural conservatism. The other is capitalist dynamism. The latter dissolves the former, unquote. So that's another uh, thoughtful conservative columnist recognizing the opposition between conservatism and capitalism. All right, now, so what we have then so far is just a number of very important conservatives, and the common pattern is that all of them are distancing themselves, some of them quite extremely from capitalism. 
let's just shift over to the other side. Uh, look at the big brains on the free market capitalist side. When we do, we find that the most prominent advocates of free markets have returned the favor and they've vigorously critiqued conservatism. So Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize winning economist, powerful advocate of free markets. He favored legalizing drugs. He favored gay marriage. And on the basis of that, he earned lots of scorn and enmity from conservatives for those policy positions. Friedman was also fiercely opposed to the military draft, and the military draft is often a cause close to many conservative hearts. should mention here on the issue of the draft, David, David Brooks, kind of a middle-of-the-road conservative who writes for the New York Times. Brooks has argued for uh, reinstating a mandatory civilian draft. Now, we should note that a mandatory draft is forced labor, right? And that's very much the opposite of the free labor that capitalism advocates as a matter of moral principle. Okay, but here's Friedman in his own words about conservatism. Not the particular policies, conservative policies that he often rejected, but as a matter of principle, quote, I'm not a conservative. A conservative someone is someone who wants to keep things the way they are. I want to change things. I'm a liberal in the true sense of the word. The word liberal means of and pertaining to freedom. And I believe in freedom. It isn't freedom for the government to take 40% of my income out of my pocket and spend it on things that we through some political mechanism have decided on. But I as an individual and you as an individual have no control over, unquote. Now that's a very strong then distancing from conservatism by a major league free market capitalist. Friedrich Hayek, mentioned earlier, the one whom uh, conservative Irving Kristol had criticized. Hayek's another major league free market economist, Nobel Prize winner, wrote an essay entitled, Why I Am Not a Conservative. In that essay, he describes himself as a principled liberal. And he goes on to explain it. Problem with conservatives, he argues, is that, just as their label suggests, they're concerned with maintaining the status quo. And they're, they want to avoid the extremes of both freedom and authoritarianism. Hayek goes on to argue that, quote, it has been regularly the conservatives who have been compromising with socialism, unquote. They've been accepting incremental limitations on freedom. That seems you know, to fit with conservatism as, a, as, a, as a, a general philosophy. As long as the change is, is gradual, they're fine with it. Right? Uh, as long as it's not revolutionary, we're fine with it. Uh, as long as it seems to preserve most of what the current system is, we are fine with it. All right, now another uh, big league free market capitalist, novelist, and philosopher, Ayn Rand, uh, in her kind of warrior-like way, she characterized conservatism as intellectually brain dead. She attacked its core positions, an essay she wrote called Conservatism, an Obituary, unquote. Rand described herself as a radical for capitalism and argued that what we need is a modern, rational morality to replace the kind of the old conservative moralities of obedience, faith, tradition, and so forth. And one very interesting things is Rand, of course, is a highly polarizing figure and has been harshly criticized from the political left. But the harshest criticisms of her have come from the conservative right. Now, if we step back from all of this, what we've got is a pattern. Leading conservative figures, all of them, at least the ones I've cited, oppose capitalism. The leading capitalist thinkers, again, the ones that I've cited, oppose conservatism. And we've got a big puzzle because popular language tends to confuse or identify conservatism and capitalism. Now, I think the, uh, you know, the popular language issue is easier to explain. You know, there's a pigeonholing tendency. Leads lots of people to look for simple ideological dualities, right? Liberal versus conservative, left versus right. That's easier to grasp. The USA, that pigeonholing tendency can be reinforced. We uh, have here an institutionalized two-party system. Seems to make it that like, uh, there's only two political options that are possible. Within that two-party uh, system, there's an ongoing big tent effort, dynamism that leads factions often to overlook and ignore different significant differences among them. 
But the more challenging problem here is philosophical, not journalistic. Conservative versus capitalist debate really reveals two conceptions of morality, two conceptions of human nature in collision. One of them is more optimistic and modern. One is more pessimistic and traditional. Capitalism is about freedom. It's about innovation, disruption, experiment, risk, embracing those. Conservatism's core ethic is about the status quo, allowing at most slow evolution and never revolution, risk avoidance, valorizing the way things have been done for a long time, tradition. And that usually translates into some significant measure of political control. Now, aside from the kinds of economic issues, we can see this opposition when we start to look at social issues that are not directly economic. Think about you know, legalizing drugs, alcohol, sexual freedom, other lifestyle choices. Those are political issues, but underlying philosophical views about morality and human nature always come to the fore as soon as free market people and conservative people start to debate them. The conservatives argue that individuals are weak, right? Sometimes in religious language, they are sinfully weak but we don't need to use the, the religious language. The point just is individuals will destroy themselves and others if they are left free. Legalizing drugs and alcohol is going to mean widespread intoxication. Sexual freedom is just going to lead to promiscuity. Lifestyle choice means individuals won't be long to meaningful social units. And so we need to subtly or overtly coerce people into the kinds of social units and social groupings that are going to give their lives meanings. Human beings need structure, structure that they don't choose, but it's got to be imposed upon them by family condition, the weight of tradition, and fairly regularly backed up by the law. Now, in response to all of that, the capitalists tend to argue the opposite. Individuals are competent. They can handle freedom. They can use it productively, for sure. Some individuals are going to abuse their freedom. They're going to fall into addiction and isolation. But most people, the large majority of people, they want meaningful romantic relationships. They want meaningful family relationships and friends. They can learn how to use intoxicants uh, responsibly. Right? Through free experimentation, exploration, all individuals can rationally improve their lives. But to enjoy the dynamism of modern liberal societies, we need to be willing to modify or even reject the old ways. So capitalists and conservatives disagree on fundamentals. Politics depends upon philosophy. It's another way to put it. Great debates in politics, contemporary politics, as in the history of politics, always turn on debates about human nature, morality, and philosophical fundamentals. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insights into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time and why that is potentially so dangerous. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. To stay up to date with the latest from Stephen Hicks himself, make sure you've subscribed to the Open College Podcast feed and follow at Open College Podcast on all your favourite social networks. And while you're online, please leave the show a review on iTunes and Stitcher. <laughs>